Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. We have a special guest today. Some of you have met her before, but she is an expert in all things HR. <laughs> uh, yes, it's true, Kim. Kim okay. Conklin. Sorry, hey, I don't mean to laugh. All things I think we'll find. <laughs> So Kim Conklin is with us. You've seen her at our CEO summits and a couple of you have engaged her in some work, but she's going to help us talk about compensation today. Um, so I just want to start sort of putting the, the, the tent over this topic um, in terms of um, compensation. So the, the first thing to realize that compensation yeah. is an environmental factor. Yeah. It, it is not. Oh, we're going to have to mute somebody here. There we go. <laughs> um, it's not a motivator, except for a limited number of people. There are a few people that are coin operated and it's all about the, the Benjamins, right? But you know, they're usually in sales and a couple of other roles, finance, finance. Most people, all they want is what's called felt fair compensation. In other words, I feel when I'm walking around that I am fairly compensated. And that, what does that mean? It means when I look internally, other people that do more or less the job I do are paid more or less what I'm paid. Hopefully less, but okay. <laughs> and when I look outside, um, people that do more or less what I do make more or less what I make. Um, and if that's true, 90 something percent of the population go, I'm good. I'm paid fairly for what I do. I'm paid fairly for my effort, for my skills, experience, background, knowledge, whatever. Done. Um, where that sometimes runs into trouble, people that are fully coin operated, right? So they are all about maximizing their personal income and they will pound you. It doesn't matter where they are relative to anybody else. They will just pound you on compensation, always. The other place that I've seen problems in this is when they have what I would call poor referent groups. In other words, you got a engineer in Macon, Georgia, who's looking at Wall Street traders and saying, I don't understand why I don't make a million and a half dollars a year. I, that's an extreme example, but they'll look at an engineer in Silicon Valley and they'll go, hey, I'm a software programmer and he, he, she's a software programmer and she makes 300 grand a year and I make 110, what's wrong with that? And you go, dude, you're in Macon, Georgia, you're not in the middle of Silicon Valley, but they'll use that data inappropriately in my estimation to justify you know, them being more highly compensated. So that's the first one is it's environmental. It's, it's about getting to the Goldilocks level of compensation. So I don't know, Kim, do you have some thoughts around that? And I know you got an agenda and things you want to hit and we will hit them all, but what do you think about just sort of that topic about felt fair compensation and that whole line of thinking? You can tell well, me. You're, okay. You already told me I, I can't swear and I can't use humor. So I, I think I've just muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a short call then. <laughs> exactly. We're done. Um, no, by the no, way, I, we're all I, we're all okay with microaggressions. So go okay, ahead. great. Um, yeah. So I, I well, the one thing I would add to what you just said on geography, on you know, making versus whatever is um, the other thing that people do is you know everyone goes on salary.com and they just plug in a job title and and just assume that you know their title is matched to the exact same job and then they wonder why it's thirty grand less. Um, um, and, and the only thing I'd add to your comment on that. Well, no, and let's just go one level deeper on that, Kim, because that's okay. super important what you brought up. Um, when you're looking at compensation, you need to look at the actual responsibilities of the person and the yeah. actual responsibilities right. of whatever job you're comparing it to. Because sometimes a VP isn't a VP and a director isn't a director, right? So I've had people, we've got one uh, client we work with, we did some comp work with them and they had significantly shrunk the role of one particular vice president, but it didn't change his job title, right? right? He's really a director, but his title is VP. If I took the VP data, he, he would look like he's massively undercompensated, but as a director, he's right on the button. 
Right. So I think that point you made is super important. So sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think that's worth going deeper on. I'll let it pass this one time. Uh, okay. So that's one thing. And well, that, that does lead me into, you got to have a, a job banding framework in the background of this. But, but the other thing, just to comment on what you said about the, the ones that, you know, money does matter. It is typically salespeople. Um, but I also find one, you solve for that in sales by having the right sales incentive in place, which is a whole comp thing. And then the others that truly it's all about the money, you just let them go because it's always going to be about the money and people that are always chasing the dollar are never going to stick with you. We have, a, we have a phrase we use for people like that. We go, are they patriots or are they merc mercenaries? Yeah. And, and the mercenaries are going to change jobs every year or two, maximizing their income. Yeah. I got one guy I know, and he's uh, in um, IT sales. And that dude is, and, and he's well into his 50s. And he's probably changed jobs every two years. Yeah. Oracle yeah. to Amazon yeah. to Microsoft to yeah. just toggling his income every time he did it. Um, well, and we actually had a... Um, a hundred years ago, I was, when I was in a GE job, we had like 700 salespeople. And it's a very, it was this very small industry, electrical distribution. And the main ones were Cutler Hammer at the time, Square D and GE. And like morons, everybody, every company would let these salespeople um, oh. quit and come back, quit and come back. So we actually put a, a practice in place that said, okay, you quit once, we'll take you back once. But we're not taking you back after that first time. And it literally just stopped it because- that's what the sales guys were doing to increase their base salary. Um, just going back and forth for 25 years between three companies. Wow. What you really needed was the three VPs of HR to get in a room with no cameras, <laughs> slide some salary charts across the table, and that'd be the end of it. Like this, we all agree yeah. this is all we're paying and no more. Like, okay, yep. Yep. You, yep. Did it in a, you did it a legal way instead of my illegal way. Yeah, it worked though. I think that point about incentivization is super important, though, Kim, um, because you got to be really careful what you incentivize. I'm going to say particularly salespeople, but mm -hmm. broadly, as we get into this mm -hmm. uh, into management teams. But, you know, we've seen it where we incentivize uh, revenue for salespeople. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Without and margin. we give them pricing discretion at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm hmm. So this is like, uh, you know, there's research on this about real estate agents. You know, the question is, the, the real estate agent, are they going to maximize the price of your house? And the answer is, they don't give a damn. Why? They'll tell you that I'm fully aligned with you. Look, I make a percentage of whatever you make. The more you make, the more I make. But a sale is digital. And they'd rather take something, particularly if the something comes easy, than the slightly, slightly larger number if I got to really bust my butt to go get that number. And so we've all had this experience. We put a number out there. It runs into a little friction in the market. What's the first thing the real estate agent does? Mm -hmm. Got to drop the price because your house stinks. You mean the house you told me was gorgeous three months ago? <laughs> yeah, that's the same one, right? <laughs> and, and because they, they need to get a sale. Your sales force is doing exactly the same thing. If yeah, they, I've, I've designed a lot of sales incentives and, and I... I mean, first of all, it really does. It's annoying because it does really take a team. It has to be your CFO, HR. You let sales help and then you kick them out because it's their own plan. Um, and and it's it can't be more than two, maybe three max financial metrics. And it's it has to be some version of margin in there, but only the stuff they control. And every company I've worked with fights over who actually owns pricing. But, um, but it's got to be the margin and it's got to be... Uh, what they control. And then there's all kinds of other stuff on whether, how you design it, whether it's a long-term sell, you know, the base versus uh, incentive and all that. Talk about that. Cause I was going to get to sort of base and incentive mix and let's just pick on salespeople for the second. Okay. We're going to get over to executive teams in a minute. How would you comp in a highly transactional short-term sale model versus a long-term take six, 12, 24 months to get a sale how do I comp those two different sales forces? How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, generically speaking, um, the, the longer the sales cycle, the higher the base. So let, let's just say if it's a, a year to two years, you do one or two things. It's like a 80, 20, 80% 80 base, 20% incentive. And the right. thing that most people screw up is you have to look at what's the total comp 
target and then back into base versus incentive. And there's market data on that um, that you can get. Um, and then, and or um, like I had a G plastics job that it, the automotive deals back in the day were it could take three years. And in that kind of scenario, anything over, you know, you, you kind of bump the edge when you get to a two year cycle. It, we literally would just do a very high base, a six figure base, and then do a, we called it a mega deal bonus um, because it, it took three years. On the transactional side, it depends a little bit on the industry, but it's like a 60, 40, 70, 30 base versus incentive. And again, you say, okay, what's the, just to keep it simple, if the target total is 100, you, you give them either 60 in a base. And then the part that that is the most critical, that 40 incentive has to be tied to the, the revenue target or the margin target. Um, so you earn the 40 incentive as you hit your, your budget. And then it's the hockey stick incentive, um, more incentive if you go over budget. The, the link that I think people miss is they just say you're, again, just keep it simple. If your revenue is 10 million and you have 10 sales guys, they each have to own a million um, and it needs to tie to the 10 million. Otherwise, I actually, I actually like them to own about 12 or 13 million. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And well, I'll over quote of the sales force to make sure I make my number, right? Yeah. Um, um, two questions there. What about 100% commission model? Why'd you go 60 40, not 100%? Okay. Um, I don't like 100% commission models. Uh, Bruce has heard me say this 100 times. Um, but because one, um, it's, it's hard to motivate. It, that's all they're going to think about. And so depending on the company, you know, if you want them to focus on anything else, like bigger company initiatives or whatever, they are going to chase that, that money. Um, it has, and it has to be really, really transactional. Um, I just don't particularly like them. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I actually agree. I've dealt with some companies that are hundred percent commission and they're like, you can make three or four sales in a day it might work, right? Mm -hmm. But the issue was, to your point, if I ever have to do anything that's sort of overhead to your job, mm -hmm. training, mm -hmm. anything, they're like, you are not paying me to do that. Right. Yeah. You pay me to sell. So I'm yeah. not doing it. Yeah. On the other side, when I do pay a base and they whine at me about filling out sales reports, I go, exactly. Yeah. I'm out. Yeah. You get paid a base and that's part of what I pay you a base for yeah. is to do that stuff that's not directly sales related. And that's yeah. Um, all right, cool. Well, and I had another question in there. Um, oh, you know, I, I have a rule of thumb and I just wanted you to react to it that, that since salespeople, no salespeople on the call, no, they're not fundamentally that bright. And so, um, this is where I remind Jim, I'm married to a very smart sales guy. Okay. There are outliers, right? <laughs> um, no, my point, and that doesn't actually have to do with their intelligence, but I want the sales commission plan to be simple enough yeah. that between the time they get the order in the building and they walk to their car in the parking lot, which is about yes. two minutes, they can calculate how much money they just made Agreed. pretty much in their Agreed. head. Agreed. So simple. Yeah. So I always say that, you know, the, the, whatever the industry, it has to be simple and easy to calculate and only tied to two or three metrics. I mean, it is insane to me how much humans love to overcomplicate crap, especially if you leave it alone to HR and finance. Um, it just, in, in it, they, if you add too much in, salespeople aren't, you know, they're not stupid. If you have this, this, this is weighted this much and this is weighted this much, they're just gonna hone in on, oh crap, I'm six months in, I can't do it. I'm only gonna focus on this piece. Yeah, um, I agree. It um, doesn't work. I usually say, you know, it's gotta be one percentage and you could have a kicker for one or two items. That's it. You know, yeah, and, then, and, and like simple, you get double the commission on that. So they can yeah. do it in their head. Well, and you, and I like the hockey stick once you get your budget, cause it motivates them to keep working for the rest of the year to get more. So let's talk about that. Where, where does a bonus or commission, where does it kick in compared to last year's number? Does it start from zero or does it start at a threshold up to a hundred and then go to another number above that? I, I think every year you restart and it's by budget. Um, 
it, it's do I what, pay, does it accumulate from zero? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So if you, yeah. So if, if it's a million dollar budget, um, you know, as you start to, when you've got enough like history in doing this within the, within a business, you can pretty much figure out um, it's going to, you know, a million dollars is probably going to take them eight to nine months. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they want that hockey stick above the million, they're going to work harder and more to get the new deals. And yeah. Okay. But uh, let's, I'm, maybe we're not Sorry. communicating. So let's say somebody achieves 50% of budget. Yeah. They get a 50% bonus if I pay from zero. Um, there, no, I see what you're saying. So if it's the, where they're, ba um, no, they, they won't, they earn the base of, let's just say in this case, it's a hundred grand, 80 grand. Um, they, they earn, they start earning the 20. I have to think about this for a second. It's been a while since I've done it. So I'll, I'll, let me, let me give you my rule of thumb here. Yeah. Maybe you could react to it. Maybe yeah. you start earning your bonus or your incentive, whatever, whether it's commission or it's a management deal at 80% of last year's. I might do 70, but it's a pretty healthy percentage of last year's number. And you earn it as we go from 80 to 100. What that does to your hockey stick comment is the slope of the curve is really steep because you ought to earn that whole bonus in 20 points of you know the last 20%, right? But that means once I go past it, you're on this super uh, sharp slope, which means yeah. if we blow past it, like 120, you double your bonus, which so gets I, excited. Yeah, I, I, okay, I see what you're saying. So I would separate that sales incentive is different than how I would do an annual incentive for a bonus plan. Oh, I, so, do, them the, I do them the same. Oh, no, 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 I don't. So on sales, to your point- This is why we be, invited Kim to fix all my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, without swearing, that's the hard part. Um, the, <laughs> By the way, you already, I'm keeping track. I'll let you know how many at the end of the uh, call. <laughs> Does crap count as a swear word? Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> for sales incentive, I typ it, it typically, the ones I've done in the past, they, they would start when you hit about 80, 75 to 80% of your target. Got it. Um, and then, but uh, an annual incentive for an executive person, um, what you would say is typically the, 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 the target to open the pool of money is the EBITDA. Typically, it's your EBITDA mm -hmm. budget. And everybody has a different view on this. Some companies start paying it at 75% of target. I've never seen anyone go below 75, but yeah, typically, but it's not over prior year. It's at that over, 80 to 85% budget. of budget. Okay. Because if your budget's wildly different year to year, it kind of screws you up. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more of a growth company would be against yeah. last year. Um, well, the problem with, well, you can make the, 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 the trigger that opens the pool be you have to hit at least prior year actual. Um, the only time, it, it depends on what the history of the company is because, you know, then, then you get all the whiners that say, you know, if you have a tough, you know, the budget's too hard or, you know, last year we had 20% growth and, and this year we got to hit more. It's just, at the end of the day, it almost doesn't matter. What did you commit to in that fiscal year? Right. And so the, you got it. Here's why I don't love the doing it against budget is now we get the budget gaming, the, the budget game. Right. Well, that has to be nailed very well. Yes. Between. Right. The but I've seen master sandbaggers at work. <laughs> so how do you get around if I'm going to do it against budget, them sandbagging the number? I'll give you an example. Well, I had a, one firm okay. I work with prior year profit was like nine million dollars. Management showed up with a six million dollar profit target for the budget this coming year. And I, I mean, I can get into what they did to make that happen, but it was, it was gross, gross. Yeah. We called it out and ended up fixing it, but they were trying to get away with a $3 million yeah. down but, and get paid bonuses on that. So well, how do you deal with it? Yeah, well, one, you gotta have the right CEO in place, but cause I, I've seen both. I've seen where um, the board creates an unrealistic budget and and the, the CEO and the team are too wimpy to push back yep. um, or the CEO does it, but um, it, it does start with having a really good CFO and you have to have some validity behind the, behind your numbers, but it really does to your point, it has to, 
that fiscal budget has to have credibility or everything falls apart. Yeah. So yeah. just carry on, and I'm thinking more executive bonuses. Mm -hmm. To some extent, it affects sales, but what about bonus caps? I don't like bonus caps. Um, well, so so typically the way, it, well, let me back up. So for to me, the incentive, it has to be in this order. You first need to have that compensation framework or job ending framework that puts jobs of like scope and complexity into the same band. That gets away from all that title stuff on and VP, hey Kim, director. Uh, na narrow band or wide band? Broadband, wide band. So for a whole company, we might have five or six pay bands Correct. and that's it. Correct. And I've done this about 15 times for huge companies and small companies. The bands are always roughly the same. Um, now, and then, so then you have a broad salary range for the band. You still have detailed uh, market data for job families mm. within that band. But what's the same is that bonus target by band. Ah. So if I'm an electrical engineer band three, I'm going to get more money than the accountant band three, because that's the way the world works. But our bonus target is going to be the same. So, so what, what kind of bonus target for an engineer or a you know, senior accountant? So what I've found it that varies somewhat across industries, but if it's anything less than 10% for a you know, someone with five to seven years, don't bother. It's not going to motivate anybody. Um, it's funny uh, you picked that number because I walk around saying you need 8% of base comp minimum to change behavior. Yeah, totally. It's 10 per, yeah, not anything under 10. You, you round it up. It's the same yeah. number, right? And then I, some companies and industries do include the hourly and that's, I would do like seven and a half percent. Really? Oh yeah. But some don't. It mostly, sometimes that's manufacturing environments. So, but, so, so let, let's go down to that to sort of, you know, mm -hmm. pointy end of the spear, direct, you know, hourly employees. And talk to me about how you structure bonus pool there, because I've always felt like, um, and, and we'll get into sort of line of sight, ability to control mm -hmm. the underlying variables that drive the bonus, right? Mm -hmm. That I'm working on the floor, I probably can't control the outcome very much. Mm -hmm. So well, it's profit sharing, it's not a bonus, because I can't, it's like magic, I can't control it. No, well, so what I, what I've done, and I've done this with companies as small as 200 hourly people to, I had one where it was um, like 5,000 drivers. <laughs> um, I, I hate hourly quarterly bonus schemes. People put so much complexity into, let's do it on productivity or safety or quality. And I had an example of a, it was a propane distribution company that had, a, you know, whatever, a couple thousand drivers. And they had this overly complicated hourly quarterly bonus thing and their wages we're not competitive. And of course I didn't say it exactly like this, but I'm like, this is really stupid. We got like, and this was a billion and a half dollar company. So they had like 2 million that they were paying. Just reallocate that 2 million with all this complexity and put it in their wages. Yeah. Um, and then, and so what I would do with the hourly, if you're going to do like a seven and a half percent bonus, particularly, you know, if it's a manufacturing or driving again, same with sales, you pick three or four metrics that are very important. And, and, and I go back to give them all a performance review. That's the piece that people don't like to do. They don't like to take the time to do a performance review for an hourly person, yeah. which cracks me up because they'll have reams of people doing massive Excel spreadsheets to collect data to pay the quarterly. It'd be a lot simpler to just say, at the end of the year, you're going to be measured on these four things. And then you let the same, same way you do with an exempt person, that performance rating is going to drive that hourly person's bonus. And it does work. So you say to the hourly guy, I'm going to get seven and a half percent bonus. If I'm rated meets expectations, I'm going to try to do well. And I can get more than that. And back to your point on the cap, you do have to cap it at like one and a half times or two times. Cause well, you, yes, because you gotta, it needs to be funded with the. Right. Even, even executives, even salespeople. Yeah. We, I've always done a matrix where it's like, in fact, when we did this at BP, that you could get up to three times the bonus the first year we rolled it out. They, and that only works if you don't rate everybody walking on water. And they, yeah. we lowered it the second year to be in a max of two and a half times because um, they, they paid out too much. I, I think, um, and, and PMB, it might be Pete Brownell, I'm not sure, um, said it is 10% across a year if you do do quarterly okay. I think the answer is yes. It's the it's the aggregate that's the yeah, key. Yeah, it's just right. And the only thing with quarterly is 
one, it doesn't tie to your fiscal results. So you could pay people out and one quarter. Of it, right? Yeah. And then people are, you know, or you're, they know you're not going to pay it out and they're like, screw it. I don't care. It, you know, it's, it's April and I know we're never going to see this money. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I just to echo your thing about comp. I worked for one company that consciously paid 30 to 40% of market base. Yeah. No, but then they had this massive variable comp scheme that would put you, if you made numbers, like at 70% of market, 80% of market. Mm -hmm. So in the good years, everybody's happy as a clam, right? Yeah. And then a bad year happened and they were all like starving, right? I mean, like people yeah. were leaving, they were starving. Yeah. yeah. And, and we had exactly the same conversation. Well, why? And it was quarterly, by the way, for, <laughs> because... Yeah. We had exactly the same conversation. Why don't we just roll some portion of this bonus into base, pay them at 50% of market. The variable is lower, but you know what? You end up in the same place. And it was yeah. a very philosophical thing of the founder to build a variable cost model on everything he possibly could, which yeah. was negative to humans and good to him. Yeah, well, and, and you had asked about inflationary environment and maybe I oversimplify my, my world, but- Thanks, Petra. Sorry, I had PMB. It's not Pete Brownell, it's- <laughs> Petra McKelvey. Welcome, Petra. Um, so I think, you know, when you get into this inflationary environment, you're somewhat a victim of what you already have in place. So if you don't already have that broadbanding in place or you don't have the, the incentive in place, but then some things, honest to God, I just listen to what people do. And I, I probably could give you 15 examples. I'm like, well, there's another one for Jim's call we can talk about on Tuesday. But, <laughs> but awesome. it's, it is insanely crazy to me the stupid things that companies do so there's one company i know um that it, it was sales and these guys have been promised for a year it, in addition to their incentive there's this extra pool long story short they're at the end of the year and they just got told we changed our mind we're not going to pay it Oof. and it's not a lot of money but it has pissed off their entire that doesn't count as a swear word um, their entire sales force, their entire sales force, because they're all saying it's the principle of it. The other yeah. one that we make way too hard, and I've seen at least three companies do this, um, if you do have a salary range, even if it, you know, well, we can't give, you know, what do you do for people that are at the max of their salary range? We, you know, they, they, we rated them excellent and we can't give mm -hmm. them, a, we can only give them a 1% increase because they're so highly comp. And I call BS on that. You just give the, the, the merit increase in a lump sum. It's not that hard. So, so if your annual budget is 3% and hopefully you're differentiating that, if I'm better, I get four to six. If I'm terrible, I get nothing. You can give that 6% increase as a lump sum instead of in, to the base. Oh, as a, as a bonus, as opposed to, yeah. A, a, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, when it, we. Yeah. And I've called a lump sum merit increase because that's what it is because you may already have an annual incentive it's it's not to offset that it's it's just your merit increase yeah and you're trying not to build it into the base that's why you're pulling correct. this move correct correct yeah. and and you know when we talk your, your your comment about everybody walking on water so i did a there was a statistic recently about government employees <laughs> and 86 percent of government employees are rated uh above average yes like, yes okay not true uh, particularly if you've engaged with the government anytime recently mm -hmm. right i'm sure some are but you know, in any organization, there's going to be a bell curve, right? Most of us are yeah. going to be B's. Yeah. There's going to be some C's and they're going to be approximately the same number of A's, more or less. And, you know, I wrote an article about, it said C's get zero. So I take the bottom of the curve. If Let's say I have a 4% bonus pool that I, or incentive or COLA co, uh, pool that I want to give for annual increases. I give zero to the C's. I give four to the B's and I give eight to the A's. Right. Math exactly. works, right? Yeah. And people go, but, 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 but zero, they're going to leave. I go, yeah, yeah. Cause they're a yeah. C it's okay. Yeah. If they leave. Yeah. That's the definition of I, a C. Well, and I've had screaming mm -hmm. matches. They scream at me, by the way, I don't honestly scream back when I'm being screamed at, but um, screaming matches with very senior people um, mm -hmm. for, with that very thing. And when you say, okay, why do you want to give it to someone? You, you're the one that told me they suck. I didn't say that. You said that. Well, they have institutional knowledge. <laughs> and I said, okay. And then we get off the phone and the CEO says to me, Kim, is there ever a circumstance where you would give a C player, you know, uh, and I said, no, I said, let me do the math for you. Yep. And I just literally, 
um, took the 3%, deleted it and added it to the top. I said, who's going to hurt more, that guy or that guy? He's like, all right, I got it. Yep. Um, yep. But, otherwise, and, and, just call it a cost of living increase and, and save the bureaucracy of going through the process. Yeah, I mean, sometimes there are people that are low performers, but they use information power to protect their job. Um, so this is their indis indispensable. Right. I literally right. had this conversation last night with a about a misbehaving CTO. Mm. And, you know, he's going to try to recover him. But the guy is, you know, the term brilliant jerk. He's a brilliant jerk. Yeah. Like super smart, really critical. Yeah. And he's a jerk. Well, then I always say, check this out. If you get hit by the proverbial bus, what would you do? Who, him or you? Well, if that CTO quit, what would you do? Well, that they was, quit. And then people start telling me, don't use hit the bus, say they got won the lottery. I'm like, okay, the point is their legacy, whatever, or their brilliant jerk, it that you're just you're just kicking the can down the road. I mean, at some point Absolutely. you're gonna have to deal with it. My my answer to him was mm -hmm. and toxic high performer. That's exactly who we're talking about, Greg. I, I said, look, unhinge the guy. If it takes you six months to unhinge him from the business, yeah, yeah. He, but he's dead man walking. Yeah. But you can't, he cannot continue. You have to get rid of this individual or you damage yeah. your entire culture. Yeah. So what, when you, people think about, you know, you talked about comp going to the market and getting comp data from, mm -hmm. and, and I want to hear where you think some good data sources are mm -hmm. paid or unpaid. Mm -hmm. um, Cause salary.com is no, I, no. Okay. Yeah. There you go. All right. So when we think about the distribution, right, there's the, you want to be at 50% of market sort of average. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be above? Do you want to be below? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be at 90? Do you want to mm -hmm. overpay 90%? Do you want to, how do you think about A, data sources and B, where in that distribution pe should people land? How should they think about that? So data sources, um, and again, global versus U.S. Um, but let's global. assume mostly U.S. because these okay. are all mostly U.S. Companies. So, um, and they've all bought each other. So, mm. you know, Aon, Radford, Mercer, Towers, yeah. Watson, those are really good. Um, and they're good for both our, um, mm. hourly and salaried, but with hourly. So, so do that slower. Towers, right. Perrin. Uh, Towers, Watson. And um, Towers, well, they, Watson. Got, they change their name again too, but uh, Aon, Aon, Radford. Radford. Uh, those three. Okay. And then, um, by industry, particularly by geography, a lot of a lot of local industries will have um, industry specific um, yeah. data, um, and it's just a matter of knowing. You just you, you can find those like through your chamber of commerce or like. Um, but generically speaking, yeah. if you take like a Redford and you have hourly chemical operators in Texas, they those guys can lead you to where they get supplement their data. So, so, so let me that's just tag on that for a second. The geographic element of looking at comp mm -hmm. data. Um, so some jobs you could argue, hey, that is a geographically local job mm -hmm. and that's it. But there are other jobs where you could say the market for competition for this job is national. Yes. So the local data is irrelevant. Uh, Correct. Take, yeah. take a, take a, a, a IT person, a computer yeah. programmer. Yeah. They can be sitting in their basement. Who cares? And yeah, so what, I mean, how do I think yeah. about, do I have to pay them? Silicon no. Valley wages, no. or can I, so how do you think about that? What, what I always did, um, particularly in, in my GE and BP days, because we always said this, you recruit nationally. So if, you know, when I get moved from Chicago to San Fran, no one, no one gives me a gazillion dollars more because when you move me back to middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, I don't want you to take it away. So one way to, so you, when you recruit nationally, you use national data, you don't use local data. That's for professional and above. Like, obviously, you know, if you're hiring drivers in Macon, Georgia, you're going to be looking at what is Macon paying. But, right. but, um, but, the, but there's things you can do on comp to do that. So one of the things we used to do is, um, and comp people do this, if um, uh, when I moved from Chicago to San Fran, I had a three-year uh, subsidy um, to offset the cost of living. Um, and after three years, I, you know, the company didn't absorb it. So that's one way to help employees when you move them to a higher cost of living, but you do it in a reload um, subsidy right. that goes away, not uh, built into their base. But if I'm recruiting IT people, programmers, I probably got to pay, and I got to look at the national data. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. And what, then what about that question of where in the yeah, bell curve? Yeah, I was going to say, to answer your question on the bell curve, 
generically speaking, most companies I've seen always target the 50th percentile. <laughs> However, I've seen companies target 75%. So even if you have 50, sometimes they target 75th percentile if they're really techie jobs or hard to recruit jobs and or if you don't have really good uh, equity or bonus. So if your company says, we don't offer an annual incentive bonus, particularly to IT, software developers, all those guys, then you're gonna have to pay more in the base. So we've got one member um, that I've actually literally had that conversation with him. His base is high. His base and bonus is like 85% of total cash comp. Mm -hmm. But when you put total delivered comp, right, which includes equity normally, right. um, he's down, you know, 50, 60 percent. He refuses to offer equity. I will not offer equity in my company. And so he says, I'm happy to pay more and not offer equity. So this is exactly your point. That's yeah. exactly the model of what you talked about. Yeah. And I've talked to him like, why don't we offer equity and align their interest to yours? He's like, not doing yeah. it. I'll pay them the cash. Yeah. And, and if just because you want to be at the 75th percentile for, say, your IT developers, you don't have to do it for the entire company. Got it. So it's about supply demand when you think yeah, about where they are. Yeah. What about sort of um, as people gain competency, right? So mm -hmm. I put them in the job, new job, new manager, you got this target of 50%. You mm -hmm. know, where should I think about that person day one, well, year that's, three, year yeah, five? That's the other thing because um, um, you target 50th, but you know, I think again, people overcomplicate and do stupid things. If you've got someone that's that's got 20 years experience, I'm sure they're going to be closer to the 75th percentile. Yeah. And you don't have to freak out. They should be making more than someone that's right out of college. Yep. Um, the other thing sometimes, and this was literally 30 years ago when I worked in an aerospace company, at that time, engineers' salaries were just kept imploding every single year. And, and we were hiring chemical engineers, electrical, mechanical. And so for the first three years, we told them, you're going to get an extra equity adjustment for the first three years, just so they could keep pace so that, yeah. you know, and then after that, we're like, then you're, then you're stuck with the rest of us and you have to earn it by merit. <laughs> um, I remember those days, like, because I'm an engineer and yeah. an engineer who got hot fired, hired five mm -hmm. years later. Yes. He's making more than me five right. years into the job. I'm like, what right. is up with this picture? Right? Well, and, um, and what cracks me up is, you know, as I go from one company to the next, back, you know, when I was, you know, in the real world, not out on my own, you get to people and they're like, you can't do that. I'm like, why can't we? Like, is there some, yes, you can just do it. Yeah. Um, what, and what the about... other thing is equity adjustments, I call them. So, you know, the gig I just left drives me nuts. They're, they're paying warehouse workers $11 an hour when Amazon's up the road paying 18 an hour. They're going to lose like, everybody. Is their turnover just... crazy? Yes. Yeah. Or no. And actually what they did is now they hired temps at a higher rate than their, their regular. And you're like, okay, well, that's one. It's a good way to get a union, which by the way, everyone laughs at me. Uh, I'm sorry, but Amazon and Starbucks and like, this is you are ripe to be unionized no matter what your industry is if you don't pay competitive wages to the hourly people interesting but anyway, so what so. if i got somebody in a role you know professional role let's say and uh perhaps they're a little legacy so they're way they're well undercompensated for the yeah. job yeah, yeah so i got a yeah vp of marketing or marketing manager and they should be making 130 if i was to recruit it and they're making 95 because they yeah. just we haven't kept them up what what do you do in that sense? do so, i say Goody, I saved 30 grand a year, or is there another? No, strategy? you got to do, I would do, I call it equity adjustment or salary adjustment. So we, we did that one year in BP, our poor manufacturing guys got paid a lot less than the chemical gurus. And so we literally just for the manufacturing jobs for that year, we had an 8% equity adjustment budget in addition to the annual 3% merit. And again, to me, it's pretty simple and you don't apply the 8% evenly. You do account for some kind of performance in there. Um, and then none of the senior leaders wanted to announce, you know, they're just tell them they're getting 11%, Kim, don't tell them it's equity. No, 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 we're going to tell them. Well, then they're going to know they're underpaid. You, you think Einstein, they haven't already figured that out. And, <laughs> and who's going to argue with you, one, that you say 8% is to bring you back up to market and 3% is your merit. And don't expect this again next year because now you're, but you do that at the budget time and 
because uh, you you cannot account for all that in a three percent merit budget. You just don't have the money. Yep. Yeah. By the way, when you use the term equity, I start thinking stock. Not sorry. Uh, sorry. Equity. Get them to yeah. equivalency. Yeah. yeah so I just salary adjustment. I got to translate sorry. in my brain when you talk sorry. a little bit. Um, yeah, and I think that's right. You know, we we um, you know, it, I, I my argument is it's like dining hall food. We we got this person that we're not. No, no, really. It's like we got this person. We're not paying them very well, but they're not performing that great either. Yeah. But if we were to replace them, it would cost us a lot more money. I go, it's like dining hall food. It's yeah. cheap and yeah. it's crappy, but the, and there's lots of it, yeah. right? Yeah. So I always say, look, pay the market rate, but then mm -hmm. expect market level performance. Right, exactly. So you'll never say, hey, we're paying them low, so we're, we'll, we'll accept low. No, we pay market and we expect market. And if they don't perform to market, we got another problem. This goes problem back to, you know, everything comes back to those two foundational things. Do you have jobs in bands that you know what the job is supposed to do? And then do you have a performance management process and an incentive design that links us all together? So we had a question um, in the chat here that's probably, it's, it's, it's interesting, Stephen raised it. Uh, they've got our remote uh, RNs, registered nurse working remotely all over the country, right? <laughs> Alabama to San Francisco, let's say, right? So, you know, how do you think about that, right? So we say, look, an Alabama nurse is not going to make what a San Francisco nurse makes geographically. But yet there's a little argue, bit of a national market in nurses. So how do you think about comp there? Is it okay to pay that that person less and that person more because of where they are? If I I would think I I would use national data and not get sucked in. Especially are they or do they move around themselves? Stephen, yeah, they do. No, hang on, he's going to answer. Oh. Yeah, no, they no, they work remotely from uh, from home, and uh, you know, nurses someday, maybe twenty years from now, will 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 probably be you know, will, they'll probably act like you know some software developers where they're going to demand uh, San Francisco when they're in Alabama, but it's not that way today. Okay, so they 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 stay in their home or they stay in the Jaguar. Yeah. That okay. Yep. Um, I mean. To some extent, I still go by the national, um, you know, what is the market pay? Um, um, I, I, I'd take the, I'd do what they are, take the advantage of the, the geographic differences. Because yeah. here's my answer. You want national money, become a travel nurse. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You want national money? It's a different number, totally is. But it means you're living out of suitcases for three, four, six months at a time. Yeah. And you make bank. If you want to make bank, become yeah. a travel nurse. Yeah, because you know, like the only yeah. way that they, they can that they can make a national rate is to become a travel nurse. Otherwise, it's always geographic. That that's no, where that, my that's true. Because yeah. that that would be the same logic as an hourly. I mean, you're not going to pay an hourly warehouse person, you know, thirty in middle of nowhere um, if you don't right. Like to. But a okay. New York City warehouse worker is going right. to make thirty. Yeah. yeah. For example. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. The, I think yeah. the Am Amazonization of sort of logistics mm -hmm. is happening. Every time they drop a facility, they come in at 17 or 18 bucks an hour. And usually the local market was not paying that, mm -hmm. but they pay a national number. That 18 buck number, that's the same number in Phoenix. We got a client in Phoenix. Right. Yeah. Another one in, in uh, Texas, it's all 18. And they're like, well, that's not the market in Phoenix. They go, well, yeah. it is. It is now. <laughs> because yeah, exactly. They exactly. can walk down the street and work for Amazon. Yeah. yeah. So they they're driving a national pay scale on logistics workers. Right, and I mean, and you started the conversation with this. It's it's it really isn't just the money that's going to keep them there either. I mean, yeah. people want the flexibility. They want to be treated like humans and. You know, it's kind of I, pendulums always swing way one way than the other. You know, in the old days, it used to be what makes it union versus non-union. Now it's like what makes people quit versus not quit. And so you kind of get the workforce you deserve. Um, nah. um, so let's deal specifically with inflationary environments. Mm -hmm. And um, without talking numbers, you and I have both dealt with inflationary environments in our career at one point or another. So how do you what specific strategies have you seen work? in inflationary environments? Is it as simple as inflation seven, so that's the raise pool? Or how, how should we think about it? Because we're heading into it, right? I mean, yeah. and my, well, my joke this morning about who wants free money, right? Borrow it for four yeah. and infl inflate it at seven. 
the same thing's happening to all your employees, right? Yeah. If inflation is seven and you give them four, you just gave them a negative 3% pay increase. Yeah. So how, I, how do we think about this? Kim? I mean, we already touched on the obvious one with hourly. You're just going to have to increase your hourly wages to be competitive. You can't like that example where they keep them at 11 and hope nothing. Do better. I have to match inflation? I don't think so. I mean, I, I mean, you know, and, and then and it depends on the job suit. So just because Amazon's paying 18 or inflation, you know, but, you know, they're at least like in that in that particular situation, I'm like, you got to at least have 15. But then the other stuff matters. Um, they didn't have day one benefits. Well, hourly people can't afford to pay their benefits for six weeks. So there's other things there besides just the comp, to your point. But on the salaried side, you know, for the 30 years I've been doing this, merit budgets are always 3%. Um, well, that, uh, that's I would because say, inflation has been too. Right. But I would, I have seen, and what I would suggest is, you know, for this, and everyone's in a different fiscal year, calendar year, I, I think you got to do four to four and a half as a budget. In a 7% but, environment. Yeah. I wouldn't go all the way up to, to seven for the year because I think it's, mm -hmm. um, because you're still going to differentiate it by performance. So if you have a four and a, I, I read somewhere, so don't quote me, like the average was 4.1 uh, or 4.2. Yeah, I the saw budget. that too, which I thought was surprising given the inflation rate. Um, I would rather go slower on that just from a, a salary perspective, because then it's all the other stuff, the bonus target, the, um, uh, do you do you know, like performance awards, ad hoc performance? Right, four hundred one k match, all of that goes. Yeah, four hundred one k match. Um, and and especially you know smaller companies, the smaller mid market companies, the one people really don't take advantage of. I, I've seen, I still can't believe I see this so many places where they don't get benefits eligibility day one. That annoys everybody, both the the six figure people and the the hourly people. Um, and it's such a simple thing to fix. Um, yeah, agreed. It, it's yeah. it's like a throwback. I don't know why we ever used yeah. to do it, frankly. Yeah. So maybe you could just touch on that for one second, and then I'm going to open it up for the last couple of minutes. Um, what trends do you see in the benefit areas? Thinking more holistically about compensation, including non-cash compensation elements. What what are you well, seeing as sort of the big trends in that space? Okay, I'll give you my cynical view because I don't agree with some of the trends, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, there you does can, you think, can put editorial comment in, in here. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I do think there is um, that day one benefits for for the ones that have large hourly populations is a big one. Yep. Um, the the four hundred one k match um, keeping that it's not so much that it's hmm. new. It's like some people took it to take it away, and it's like you got to keep it in there. Um, and and the other one that's not so much health benefits, but that flexibility to work from home um, or, and not just work from home, but have a flexible schedule of when you're in the office and when you're not, that's not going away. And, and I don't know, I read something else that, that that's like, I, I already forgot what the number one was, but the number two reason people, that's why um, that is a huge issue in recruitment that people will not take jobs if they can't do one or two ways or days from home. Um, My son just changed jobs and he only looked at remote jobs. Yeah. And so, you know, I hate to say this, but, you know, there's older seasoned experienced people that are like, no, everybody has to come back to the office. I, I, I think you were looking at me when you said that. I hey, was. Hey. <laughs> um, but wait, what was the other trend? Um, oh, about, the trend, you got the trend, a, your, your my point cynical is, trend. You got, and I literally had this conversation with somebody. I want to see them in the office because when they're yeah. at home, they're all screwing off. I know it's yeah. Like I said, you get the workforce you deserve. Yeah. Um, but the, tr the other trend which I don't think this is going to stick. And I just don't fundamentally believe people care as much about is, you know, all the, the mental health benefits on the, mm -hmm. um, uh, on your, on your health benefits. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't think that one is as much, but there's other things like there's, there's better, uh, people are starting to do more on, um, financial, uh, like giving people financial counseling. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Like, yeah, that's a good one. And for, um, uh, being more generous in the adoption and family stuff. Um, I would do those before I did that because the mental health stuff's already there. Everyone has EAPs. Um, um, I just, that just feels like you're, I don't know the right word, window washing. We, we, you know, just on to tap on that and I'm going to open up for a couple of minutes here. Um, 
you know, we had maternity and, and then added paternity benefits in right. one particular organization, right. not right. to the max. Right. Cause there's some like Deloitte right. does a year maternity leave a year. Well, some like, countries do that. Yeah. Well, and we just weren't going to map, but we did like 13 anyway and paternity leave. We did that too. But then here was the key one adoption and birth the same. Mm -hmm. You get the same maternity yeah. leave, whether you adopt or you. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. That, and then it's, it's, it's absolutely appropriate, I think. Yeah, um, no, I do too. Oh, and then the other one I forgot is the obvious, whether you call it PTO or vacation, uh, don't be stingy on new hires that are experienced new hires. Um, so, you know, some companies, especially smaller, you know, you come in with 20 years and if you had four weeks of vacation, people won't let you have, four, that's just. No, it's baloney. You got to match their prior number, yeah, right? Yeah, that's not sustainable either. Uh, yeah. Any a couple of people have asked questions, but do we have any sort of last comments or questions before we uh, before we wrap it up today? And and yeah, the point we're finding totally remote is more of an IT challenge. Yeah, it it is. It's also a management challenge, I think. Like, how do you manage these remote people effectively? How do you give them promotion opportunities? Those are all real questions. Well, any other comments or? Well, sorry, like you said, it also depends on the job. Like if you're yeah. an HR person in a plant, sorry, you got to show up. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments on, uh, on this? Hopefully we hit a bunch of interesting topics for you. Not, not having a management show. Good for you. That's some are <laughs> on managing remote employees. Cause yeah. you know, that dive has a slightly higher level of difficulty than mm -hmm. I can see you every day. Deliverables are outcome based then it's easier to manage. As a role. Can be, yeah. well, and, and you also make a schedule of when you want, you know, humans to be together. I mean, I do think they have to come together once in a while, but it's just a matter of managing the logistics. I, you know, I, I did a, an article about um, you know, work location as a tool. So there are times that it makes sense to be together because we're going to collaborate or brainstorm or build relations or whatever. There's other times where being alone is better for the particular job, like I'm working a spreadsheet or doing analytics right. or I'll do better by myself. And so think about the work you're doing and which location lets me be right. better at that work. Right. As opposed yeah. to you're always coming into the office yeah. or, no. or you're always at home. No. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Awesome. Well, great. Well, Kim, thank you so much. This was a blast. Um, <laughs> this is like a, a great comedy team. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I like working with you. Um, oh gee, thanks. <laughs> who's Abbott? Who's Costello? I don't know. We'll figure that out later. Um, no, who's on first? Who's on first? Yes. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Kim, for helping us out. And we'll no see worries. you all next. This podcast is brought to you by the CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com, or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.